Uh, we'll be coming back in the fall. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. I, I sort of reviewed, the, I don't often look at the videos of, of these uh, uh, lectures, but I did on Elijah and Elisha. I, 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 I confused those two so many times. They weren't confused in my mind, but boy, verbally, I blew it totally. So thank you for spring, fall, winter, any time. This, uh, as our brothers already let you know, is the last uh, lecture for the... Uh, this school year, I've still, I was to school so many years, I didn't do any good very well in it, but I went. <laughs> and uh, so this is the last uh, lecture for the school year. We'll be back, Lord willing, in the fall. And if you're going to show this video, we need some lights here, but I don't know if that's working. I don't know. Anyway, we are continuing our study of the books of history. And this evening, interestingly enough, we're wrapping up our study of the 12 books of history. The 12 books of history. Uh, give us the history of Israel from the time of the conquest led by Joshua to the time the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity and rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah. We finished uh, the pre-exilic books uh, several weeks ago. The pre-exilic books are the books that give us the history of Israel from the time of the conquest up until the time of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, we're now working our way through the three post-exilic books. These three books, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, uh, tell us about the history of Israel after the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity. The book of Ezra uh, tells us about their return and their struggle to rebuild the temple. Uh, the book of Nehemiah tells us about rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, and the book of Esther tells us about uh, an event that took place among the Jews who did not return. Now, when the children of Israel returned from captivity, they needed to get two things in order. They had to get their religion in order, and they had to get their government in order. In Ezra, we learn about getting their religion in order. They got the temple rebuilt. Uh, in Nehemiah, we, we learned about them getting their government in order. They rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. I explained last week why that was critical. You can't have a government in antiquity without a wall as a means of defending folks against the enemies. Now, that was good. They, they got their religion in order. They got their government in order. They started to rebuild the nation. But not everyone returned. In fact, most Jews didn't return, as I pointed out on more than one occasion, until just recently more Jews lived outside of Israel than in Israel. Uh, in fact, shortly after Israel became a nation, nation in 1948, there were more Jews in New York City than there were in Israel. Um, but God was concerned not just about the Jews who returned. He was concerned about the Jews who did not return. And we give a, have a name for them. It's called the diaspora. It's, they view them as a nation. And God is concerned about the diaspora. They've suffered persecution for the last 2,000 years, but they've survived amazingly well. Okay, <clears throat> Esther is a book that uh, complements Ezra and Nehemiah, as just pointed out. Ezra tells us about get the Jews getting their religion in order, Nehemiah getting the government in order, and Ezra complements those two books by telling us about God's concern for the Jews who didn't return. We also talked about four kings that played a, a critical role in Israel's history in the post-exilic years. The King Cyrus, who conquered the Medes and Persians, or the, excuse me, conquered the Babylonians, let the Jews return. Darius, who uh, supplied money to rebuild the temple. Uh, Xerxes, his son, who played an instrument, a, a, a very dominant and critical role in the life of Esther. And then Artaxerxes, his son, who, was respond, help, who helped Ezra uh, with the revival because he gave him the authority to turn uh, to, to Israel to uh, instruct the folks in God's law and gave money to Nehemiah to rebuilding the wall. There are in the book of Ezra, uh, Esther uh, several main subjects. The first is the uh, subject of, of Naaman. Haman, Naaman, excuse me, Haman. And Haman is a very wicked man who hates the Jews and wanted to kill them. And God interfered. This is really the basic story. The basic story is a man named Haman who wants to kill all the Jews. And God knows about this and he prepares for it ahead of time by raising up um, 
uh, Mordecai and his niece Esther to put the kibosh on that. And really this uh, story of Haman wanting to kill the Jews, all the Jews in the world, is an age-old story. In the Garden of Eden, Genesis, right after Adam and Eve sinned, God came down, and we are all familiar with the story, and he told Adam he was going to be cursed. We have to work hard to earn a living. And uh, Eve would be cursed because she would be struggling to be painful to have children and curse the earth. And he also basically told Satan that the, uh, one day a seed of hormone would come and crush his head. From that time on, Satan was after whoever that seed of Solomon might be. And uh, when Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, God made it very clear that the seed would come from the Jews. And as a result, Satan has done his best over the years to eliminate the Jews. He had Pharaoh try to kill off every, every young boy who was born. And uh, this guy, Haman, uh, tried to wipe out the entire Jews. Hitler tried his best. Satan has been trying to eliminate Jews for thousands of years. He has failed, but it still caused a lot of damage and a lot of grief. And this is just another chapter in that ongoing saga of Satan trying to uh, kill the Jews. All right, the story of Esther begins with a 180-day banquet. That's quite a party. Uh, it was thrown by King Xerxes, and uh, actually what it was about was it was a planning festival. What he did was this. He, uh, is, is we, we've had this, this, this uh, map before. You're familiar with it. The Persian Empire was very, very large. In the east, it extended to India, and in the west, it extended as far as modern-day Libya. It, it, it basically controlled all the land in between, which included the, the kingdoms in Mesopotamia and Syria and Palestine and Egypt as far as Libya and in the north, modern-day Turkey. And it spilled over into Macedonia, which is a southern portion of Europe. And as you look at the map, you can see these kings and Persian kings wanted to add to their empire, Greece. And uh, Darius tried to do it, but he lost at Marathon. But now uh, we have his son Xerxes coming along and trying to make, do what his father was not able to do, and that is to conquer the Greeks. And so what he did was he had a 180-day banquet to call all the officials from his Persian empire together to plan the battle to take Greece. So he called the noblemen, he called officials, he called military officers, and for 180 days they had this great banquet, and it was really a, 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 a banquet in which they got spent time preparing for this great battle. Uh, after the 180-day banquet, in which apparently they made their plans to attack, because part of this has to be persuasion. He's the king, but he's got to get the guys his noblemen and his officers, to come along with him. Apparently they agreed it was a good idea. They would go and conquer Greece and sort of wrap up uh, that, that little missing piece in their empire. And after the 180-day banquet and the planning had been completed, it was time to relax and get drunk. And that's pretty much what the seven-day feast was about. It was. It was. In fact, the scriptures make it fairly clear. It was just about drinking. They'd done their 880 days. That's the planning. But now they have a seven-day seven banquet in which it was really about planning. In fact, the king ordered his servants to get everybody, and the scriptures tells us, give everybody as much to drink as they want. Boy, I'll tell you, <laughs> from my old non-Christian days, if someone offered the guys at my school as much to drink as they wanted, the whole school would have been drunk. And that's unfortunately what was happening here, including the king. And I guess after a while he got so been out of shape, that he wanted to show off his pretty wife, Vashti. She must have been beautiful, and I'm glad he was happy with her, but she was not happy about this request. I mean, the request goes to the, to, to his, to the palace in which she was living, that he wanted her to come and show off her beauty to all her drunken buddies. And she said, no way, Mac. 
I'm not going to do that. Well, he got furious. He got angry, and uh, he deposed her. And that was partly encouraged by his officials. It's an interesting story because these guys were afraid their wives would tell them no <laughs> to whatever. So it's really a macho thing. So some of you guys complaining about feminism, I complain sometimes myself. Keep in mind, as I'm reminded often, men are pigs. <laughs> and that's just the problem. And they were at their piggy best at this moment. And Vashti said, no way, no way. So uh, the guy saying, but our wives, if, if your wife can say no to you, our wives can say no to us. So they told him, they really did, they convinced him that he ought to get rid of her. Not rid of her by killing her, divorce her, dump her. All right, <coughs> let's read about it. Beginning of chapter 1. By edict, the king of the kings, no limits were placed on the drinking. The king instructed all his palace officials to serve each man as much as he wanted. Not a good thing. But the planning has been over with. And keep reading. On the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was in high spirits, we know why, because of the wine, we're told exactly why, he told the seven eunuchs who attended him to bring Queen Vashti to him with the royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty. I suspect that was a little lewd. We're not told. For she was very be a very, very beautiful woman. But when they conveyed the king's order to Queen Vashti, she refused to come. This made the king furious, and he burned with anger. All right. The banquet was more of this, uh, after a 180-day banquet, which was a planning feast, it was a seven-day feast. This banquet was mo more about drinking than planning. Xerxes wanted to show off his beautiful wife, Vashti. Vashti refused. He became furious, and he deposed her. Now, the next event in our story is not recorded in the scriptures. We have to look at secular history to find out what happened. The Persians attacked Greece. Now, ancient writers tell us that they came with an army of about a million or a million and a half. Those were probably exaggerated figures, but they still came with a vast army. Now, this large army of the Persians is, is, is something that Daniel's going to be, that wrote about years earlier, and it's likened to a great, big, lumbering, powerful bear. But we'll get to that next fall, Lord willing. Uh, at any event, the estimates are they, they had at least 150,000. Conservative estimate, modern-day estimates are they came with about 150,000. Again, ancient writers say a million or so, but that's probably a bit of an exaggeration. And Xerxes' father, Darius, had lost at the Battle of Marathon. We talked about that. Uh, he comes back, and the idea of, Mar of Marathon when Darius attacked Marathon, he was going to try to win the battle at Marathon and then march on Athens. Uh, he failed at Marathon, so he went home with his tail between his legs. Uh, his son Xerxes did much better. His son Xerxes actually conquered Athens. He went north to Thermopylae and won there, though it was kind of an ignoble win in that he, with his vast army of, of 150,000 up against just a handful, remember the 300 Spartans held off a big chunk of the army? There was more than the 300 Spartans there, but nevertheless, he won, but he, he won over an army that outnumbered, outnumbered 10 to 1, 20 to 1. So while he won, that was kind of an ignoble win. But anyway, things are going well for Xerxes, but then he loses his entire fleet at the Battle of Salamis, which is a little island off the coast of Athens. And uh, Greeks were sailors. Well, you can see. Look at where they are. The Persians weren't. And uh, he got kind of suckered into that battle and did not do well. He went home depressed. And he wanted the comfort of a wife, but he's already dumped his beautiful Vashti. He had a harem filled with beautiful women, but he viewed them as toys. Kings did. That's part of the piggy part. And he probably regretted his impetuous deposing of Vashti, who seems to have been a fairly decent woman. She wasn't going to come and show herself off 
before his drunken buddies, is A suggested he look for another wife, not a toy for the harem, for the harem, but for a real wife that he could have an intimate relationship with and give him some comfort because apparently he was depressed. I mean, he had spent 180 days building this vast army. They go to Greece. He loses after it looked like he was going to win, lost his fleet. He's down. He's depressed. And Vashti is gone. He, enough with the toys. He wants a wife. So they said, why don't we uh, send out a decree and invite uh, women from all over Persia, and the Persian Empire spread from India to Libya, that's pretty big, uh, to come and apply for the job. And they did. And that's where Ezra, uh, we'll read about it here. Ezra's going to come in. Later, when the anger of King Xerxes had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for a Beautiful young, for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of the realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem of the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. And let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. This, is again, is where er, er, excuse me, Esther comes in. She applied for the position under the encouragement of her uncle Mordecai. Apparently, Esther's mother and father had died when she was a young girl, and her uncle Mordecai became uh, her uh, guardian. And they both decided this was a good idea. So she joined uh, the harem, where she was turned over to the king's unit for those 12 months of beauty treatments and special diet. Mordecai, in suggesting that uh, Esther apply for this job, also told her to uh, deny, well, well, don't let them know that she was a Jew. Because even at that time, anti-Semitism seemed to be a part of the Persian Empire. So he forbid her to reveal her identity as a Jew. The situation was this. Esther had joined the harem of a pagan king. She was given beauty treatments and special food for 12 months, all in preparation for a tryout to be a pagan king's queen. The food she was given would almost certainly have included foods that had been prohibited by the Mosaic law, foods that the great prophet Daniel had refused to eat when he had been taken captive by the Babylonians. At the end of the 12 months of preparation, Esther would be called into the king's chamber to spend the night with him. If the king liked Esther more than he liked the other women trying out for the job, she would be made queen. This is the deal, folks. If not, she would join the second harem where she would remain for the rest of her life as a concubine. Now, concubines were second-class wives. They weren't first-class wives, second-class wives, but not queens. Concubines were uh, beautiful women who were occasionally called to the king's chambers to please them. Concubines were toys kings played with. Well, after 12 months of preparation, Esther spent the night with King Xerxes, and he liked her and chose her to be his queen. The question we have to ask ourselves is this. Was this what a godly Jewish woman would have done? And the answer is no. No. Now, we like Esther, and we like Mordecai to a certain extent. They have been used by God, they were used by God in the history of the Jewish people to accomplish good things. Between them, they're going to save the Jews from annihilation. So it doesn't mean that God didn't use them. It doesn't mean that we won't see them in heaven. But you've got to remember, folks, this was not godly behavior. So just because God used them and because we're going to see them in heaven, you can't excuse all their behavior any more than we can excuse our own bad behavior. Sometimes we, that we have, and this is sometimes you go through scriptures, we have a lot of extraordinary men and women. And we're sort of tempted at times to kind of excuse their bad behavior. And the scriptures really don't allow that, and we shouldn't allow that. Even the best of the great men and women scriptures did some things they shouldn't have done. And in this particular case, uh, Esther shouldn't have been doing this, but she did. 
And I don't think she was looking at the situation as one and being, one day I'm going to be called on to save the Jewish people. Now, that wasn't the deal at all. I mean, being queen is good. <laughs> not being queen is not as good. That was the deal. If you're queen, things are better than not being so, not being queen. Okay. In the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, the book, excuse me, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we're told over and over again that one of God's major complaints against the Jewish people was that they were marrying Gentiles, remember? Yet this is exactly what Esther did. A godly Jewish woman and a godly guardian would not, have, would not want a marriage to a Gentile, and in particular a pagan king who was inclined to drink too much and make irrational judgments and collect harems filled with women he used as toys. We've got to be square about this. God isn't inviting us to delude ourselves about the great men and women in Scripture. So we're not going to delude ourselves about Esther and Mordecai. But we hopefully don't paint a worse picture than we should. A godly Jewish woman would not have tried out <coughs> for the position of being a man's wife by spending the night with him. A godly Jewish woman would not have casually dismissed the dietary requirements God demanded of his, of his people. The author of the book of Esther makes it clear that God protected, uh, this is what one writer, I'm quoting a writer, the author of the book of Esther makes it clear that God protected and used Esther and Mordecai in spite of the fact that they were not living according to the laws God had commanded the people of Israel to obey. There's nothing in the book of Esther to suggest that Esther and Mordecai were people of great faith in Jehovah, but they did believe in God and in God's concern for his people. That's the good side. Now, that's where our story of Esther will stop for a moment, and we're going to deal with an incidental event that took place. She's the queen. She's saying, apparently, from all I can gather, King Xerxes liked her very much, loved her deeply, and from all we can gather, they had a good marriage. And they seemed to get along well, and he was he made it very accommodating to her. But we're going to hold, leave that story for a moment and go to another incident that took place, but will have some significance later on, in which Mordecai, this is the guardian who encouraged his niece <laughs> to go apply for the job. Mordecai saved the king's life. Mordecai discovered a plot between two of the kings. Remember, keep in mind, we talk, I don't, we, Mordecai uh, was a, probably a minor government official. Government officials hung out at courthouses. The courthouses in antiquity were the city gates. And that, when you read through the book of Esther, you'll find that he was off, could often be found at the city gate. That's where the, the, uh, the government offices were, were in the city gates. So he was a minor government official, and as a minor government official, he was at the city gates, and he was at the city gates once, and he heard two of the king's guards plotting an assassination. And what he did was tell Esther, who told the king. The king investigated, found out the guards really were trying to assassinate him, and had them executed. So... Remember that event. We're going to come back to it a little later on. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, let's read about it in chapter 2, uh, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were hanged on a gallows. All this was recorded in the book of the annals of the presence of the king. Now, we'll leave that story, and we're going to move ahead a few years. And we're going to be introduced now to the wicked Haman. Haman was a prominent government official, and apparently... Uh, King Xerxes liked him and promoted him to a very, very powerful position, one that required anyone in his presence to kneel in homage. It wasn't kneeling to worship. It was simply kneeling to homage the way most men and women were required to kneel before kings and queens and, and other sovereigns. So he was elevated to a very high position. Everyone kneeled to him when he came by except Mordecai. So notice, it. this is the wicked Haman. This man is kneeling, this man is kneeling, this man is kneeling. Guess who's not kneeling? Mordecai. Now, we don't know why. That's one of the questions I have when I get to heaven. 
is I don't know what the beef was. Some say, well, because, uh, because uh, Mordecai was religious and he wouldn't bow down to worship another. It had nothing to do with worshiping. I know some people have some really lame ideas about things in scriptures. Had nothing to do with the scriptures. Say nothing about kneeling to pay homage to a sovereign. And if he, if 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 Mordecai had kneeled to pay homage to Haman, that would not be worship. That was not prohibited by the scripture. Um, so that wasn't the case. We don't know why. We just there's probably some personal problem between the two since they both hung out at the city gate. And they probably had a beef with each other. Whatever the case was, Mordecai wouldn't kneel before him. And Haman became so angry, not only he wanted to kill uh, Mordecai, he found out he was a Jew, he wanted to kill all the Jews. Logical, right? Anti-Semitism is a real problem. So, <clears throat> he was, however, a suspicious man. And so, before he went to the king, asking the king permission to kill all the Jews in the Persian Empire, he, as a suspicious man, decided that he, the, he, he should uh, draw straws, cast lots, cast the purr, whatever the deal was, to determine what month he wanted to ask permission to kill all the Jews. Now, so he, what he did was he cast the purr. I've, I've tried to figure out what casting the purr is. It's a bunch of little stones. It's kind of like rolling dice. It's like casting the lot, whatever the case was. It's, I, you know, I've, I read several articles, and each one was a little different. I wish people would get their history straight. <laughs> I'm not, if it's just, sometimes you check out some of these things, and you've got three different explanations, uh, th uh, three different authors, you get three different explanations. But it was sort of like drawing straws, he, casting lots, whatever the deal was. That's what he did to, uh, uh, to his suspicious nature. Uh, he had to do this, and so he did, and it said, that this was in the month of Nisan, which is the first month of the year, and uh, the, 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 the purr told him to do it 12 months later in the month of Adar. So then he went to the king to ask, ask permission to execute the Jews. Now, this is, this is important. He's got 12 months, which is going to give time, God time to work through Esther and Mordecai. So I only mention that business about casting the purr because, in a sense, God had control over that. When he cast the purr, he had to wait 12 months to kill all the Jews. This will have a part to play in saving them, okay? It's the reason the scriptures mentioned it. And the king granted his request. Not real thoughtful sometimes, these guys. Mordecai is distressed. Well, understandably so. I don't think he was distressed just for himself. I think he was distressed for the Jewish people. I think he had a genuine love for the Jewish people, and this grieved him. And Esther chapter, Esther chapter 4, verse 1, When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. And when Esther heard about this, she sent a eunuch to uh, Mordecai to find out what the problem was. And Mordecai sent a message back to Esther through the eunuch, the eunuch telling her to beg the king for mercy. Uh, and Esther told Mordecai through a eunuch. They went back and forth. Apparently, she, uh, he, Mordecai wasn't allowed in the uh, in the harem palace, which you can figure, understand. Keep king's going to keep all those gals of his uh, protected. Uh, so uh, he sent back the he sent to through the eunuch a message to uh, Esther, beg the king for mercy. Esther told. Through a told Mordecai through a eunuch that this might be a problem, and the problem was this: in order for her to go into the throne room to talk with the king, she had her own palace where the harems and the, all the, the harem girls were kept. Uh, if she went into the throne room uncalled uh, for, it was a death penalty. Strange laws, but. That was the law. That was the problem. We read about it here. All the king's officials and people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman to approach the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend his gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called 
to go to the king. In other words, Mordecai would like to go talk to him, but I got a problem. If I go and he doesn't hold out his golden scepter, I'm dead. So I understand she was a little apprehensive. Um, Mordecai then sent a message back saying to telling Esther that the Jew, she was not going to escape, so she was dead anyway. Makes sense. So she agreed to go before the king, but asked the Jews in Susa to fast. She didn't ask them to pray. It will pop up a little later in our summary, so I'm just pointing it out now. Fast for three days and three nights, which they did. And then she approached the king after they had fasted for three days, and he extended the golden scepter, saved. And he asked her what she wanted, and she said she wanted to invite the king and the wicked Haman, she didn't call him the wicked Haman, but we will call him the wicked Haman, uh, to a banquet. And uh, at the banquet, uh, Esther invited the king to a second banquet. What happened was when she invited the king and Haman to the banquet, at the banquet, the king says, what can I do for you? And she said, she sort of chickened out. But she really wanted to say, I'm a Jew. I got a whole bunch of Jewish buddies. And we're all going to get wiped out. But she kind of chickened out. I don't understand. She didn't know what was going on. So uh, she said, I'll tell you what, how about a second banquet? <laughs> well, the king played it, went along with it. What's interesting, though, is the wicked Haman, he loved this. I mean, not only had he been promoted by Xerxes to a lofty position, the queen is inviting him to a second banquet. Isn't just, that's all she mentioned. Other people probably came as well. But she said, I want you and Haman, second time around. He's full of himself now. He is totally, totally full of himself. And on his way home, he bumps into Mordecai, who on the hill? He decides then and there, let's build a gallows and hang this guy. We'll go through the PowerPoint. Haman decided to build a gallows to hang Mordecai on his way home. Haman ran into Mordecai, who again refused to kneel. Haman decided then and there to build a gallows on which to hang Mordecai. Now, hold that thought. Let's go to nighttime. The second banquet's not here yet. God has got another plan going. That night, the king couldn't sleep. And he ordered that the record of his reign be brought in and read to him. He wanted to feel better about himself. They read about Mordecai saving the king from the assassination plot. Remember I told you a while ago? Remember that story? It's going to pop up. But it's popping up now. They read about Mordecai saving the king from the assassination plot. The king then discovered that Mordecai had not been rewarded. i got to do this. This man saved my life. I didn't reward him. Shame on me. So he gets up the next morning. He goes out into the uh, courtyard to look for some advisor to give him some advice on how best to honor Mordecai. And he calls one of his servants in, is there anybody around, any of my aides here? They said, yes, Haman, the wicked Haman, is, has come in. So he goes to Haman and says, Haman, if I want to honor a man, really honor a man, who's, oh, I'll a lot to, what would you suggest? Well, Haman's so full of himself, he thinks the king wants to honor him. Egos get you in trouble all the time, don't they? <laughs> so he said, I'll tell you what you do. If you really want to honor a man, really, really honor a man, take one of your robe, royal robes that you've worn, put it on the man. Then put the man on a, one of your horses that you've ridden. And then have a prominent official lead that horse through the cities, the streets of Susa, telling everybody that this is what, God, uh, what the king does for a man he wants to honor. You know where this is going. <laughs> it's too good to be true. Uh, no, it's not too good to be true. It's, it's, it happens. The king asked Haman how best to honor a man. Notice, this is the king, and this is, hey, he's smiling for it. God's happy. Okay. Go at once. And then, then, then the king tells Haman to do that for Mordecai. Oh. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. 
So Haman got the robe and the horse. He rode Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. This is Haman. This is Mordecai. So he really got not a happy man. Okay, now we got a second banquet, though. Hopefully Esther's not going to chicken out this time. Esther dropped the bomb at the second banquet. Shortly after Mordecai had, well, Haman had paraded Mordecai, he attended the second banquet. And this is when she dropped the bomb. So the king and, what? Anyway, so the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And as they were dining wine on, the second, on that second day, the king again asked Queen Esther, what is your petition? This is why do, what do you want from me? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. The kings always say this half the kingdom thing. I've never seen anyone take them up on it. We'll try that sometime. I mean. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. Eh, that's a little stretch. <laughs> king Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, The adversary and enemy is the vile Haman. Ooh. Then Haman was terrified, rightly so, before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling from the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will you even m molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as word, the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows 75 feet high stands by Haman's house. We, isn't that interesting, huh? He, ha he had it made for Mordecai, who spoke up, to help the king. The king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's fury was subsided. Something had, so at this point, the arch enemy, Haman, is dead. So they're not going to have anybody pushing for the annihilation of the Jews. But we still have a problem. There's this edict that has been decreed by the king and that is that all the Jews in the Persian Empire are to be killed in the 12th month, the month of Adar, which is eight months away. And there's this really strange thing in Persian law. You've already found a strange thing. If you go into the king's throne room without being summoned, you, you die. So that's a little bit weird, too. But this other one is, once an edict has been decreed, it can't be withdrawn. Not even the king can withdraw it. So... As things stand right now, all the Jews in the Persian Empire have to die. But what you can do is have another edict. And that's what they decided to do to sort of ameliorate the first edict. And the first, second edict would be that the Jews could take up arms and get help from their neighbors to defend themselves against those who would attack them. And guess who got to write that edict? Mordecai. He's, he's going to be doing well shortly. Persian law forbid canceling early edicts. A counter decree could be issued. King Xerxes let Mordecai write another decree in the king's name. This decree allowed the Jews to assemble together to defend themselves. Eight months later, about 75,000 of the Jews' enemies were killed. And it wasn't just because the Jews assembled, but their neighbors helped them because, guess what? The fear of Mordecai seized them. You know why the fear of Mordecai seized them? Because King Xerxes made Mordecai the second most powerful man in the Persian Empire. These people knew who buttered their bread. So, things are going well. Haman's destruction and Mordecai's elevation. Haman's ten, ten sons were also hanged, and Mordecai was exalted to, this, to a position second only to the king himself. All right, some commentary. <laughs> 
And we'll close after this. The story that is told in the book of Esther is a wonderful story of God delivering his people. We all agree with that. From those who would do them harm. It's a story of deliverance that Jews have celebrated for thousands of years at the festival of Purim. Now you know where the festival of Purim came from. In spite of this, however, the book of Esther is in many ways a very strange book. Harry Ironside, a great uh, Chicago preacher from the previous century, said, opened his commentary on the book of Esther by asking this question. Why did God inspire so strange a book? And it is strange in a number of ways. To begin with, Esther is the only book in the Bible in which the name of God is never mentioned, and God's law is never mentioned, and sacrifices or offerings are never mentioned, and prayer is never mentioned. Remember I told you a while ago, they fasted for three days. I gave you a warning. It is true that Esther asked for the Jews to fast for three days before she went to see the king, but she did not ask for prayer, nor do we ever read of Esther and Mordecai praying. And what are we to make of the two heroic characters in this story, Esther and Mordecai? They were clearly heroic characters, the, the heroic characters God used to save the Jewish people from annihilation. That's true. But neither of them could even begin to measure up to, the great, to great men like Moses and Joshua and David and Elijah. Nor could they measure up to the great women like Hannah, mother of Samuel. Wow, she's not like Hannah, folks. And Ruth and Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Anna. Remember, Anna was the woman who stayed day and night in the temple worshiping and praying and fasting. Esther and Mordecai simply don't begin to measure up to these great saints. Can you imagine Hannah or Ruth or Elizabeth or Mary or Anna saying to themselves, I'd like to be married to a drunken pagan king and be part of his harem. I can't imagine that. Now, I'm not knocking these people, folks, but let's get real about what we're studying here. I can't imagine that. But Esther did, and Mordecai encouraged it. Furthermore, do you can imagine any of them wanting to say, I'll spend the night with the guy with to the guy to see if he likes me well enough to marry him? No. Some lessons that we can learn from the book of Esther. God sometimes uses spiritually mediocre men and women to accomplish great things. In other words, there's hope for us. Most of us don't. Some nervous laughter back there. Most of us are not giants. Now, I'm glad we have giants. We talk about them because God wants us to. He, te he, put, he, he tells us about these giants in his word. He tells us about their flaws as well, but clearly these men were giants. And he wants us to imitate the things they did right. He encourages us to do that. We need examples to follow. Sometimes it can be a little discouraging. I read about Elijah. I read about Isaiah and men like that and John the Baptist. I, I'm not, I can't even stand in their shadow. Maybe some of you can. I can't. It can be a little discouraging sometimes. But, you know, we get a little help from Mordecai <laughs> and, and Esther because they weren't giants. But God used them. And there's no doubt in my mind I'll see them in heaven. I think they were men and women who, who genuinely worshipped Jehovah and they had a great affinity for the Jewish people. They weren't giants. Let's don't pretend they were. And also, sin does not necessarily prohibit great deeds. I've heard... Preachers say, if there's any sin in the camp, uh, nothing good can happen. That's simply not true. Now, it's better if you don't have sin in the camp or it's sin in your life. I'm not encouraging you to give a pass on sinful behavior. But the idea that somehow you have to be kind of sinless, perfect, walking with the Lord every minute, every day, to be of value is simply not true. If that's okay, I wouldn't, if that was the case, I wouldn't get out of bed. The truth is, you take the very best you are, and you go out and you serve the king. I've, there are a lot of things in my, I don't know how introspective you are. One of the, the blessings of being a, a, a pastor, teacher, uh, one of the blessings is you get to spend all day in the scriptures. It's also a bit of a curse <laughs> because you examine your heart in front of it, and all you see is, look, I'm pretty ugly. And if you, I don't have, to, again, I don't know how introspective you are. I'm fairly introspective. Everything I talk about, I sort of look at myself in light of all that, and I'm not too happy with a lot of the stuff I see. Now, God's doing a better work in me today than he did 20 years ago. I've improved, but I also look at these giants, and I see I have a long way to go. And that can be very discouraging. Be honest with yourself. 
that can be very discouraging when you look at yourself, if you really are introspective, and you measure yourself against some of those others. It, it, yeah, that can be kind of depressing. So God gives us Mordecai <laughs> and Esther. He can still use folks who aren't such hot shots. And that's encouraging. It's sort of a negative encouragement, but that's an encouragement just the same. Now, Warren Wiersbe wrote, and we'll close with this, God's name is nowhere seen in this book, but God's hand is nowhere missing. He is standing somewhere in the shadows, ruling and overruling. As you study the book, note the following evidences of God's providential workings. Esther being chosen. Again, God's name isn't mentioned. Prayer isn't mentioned. None of that stuff is mentioned. But notice, Esther is chosen. God's sovereign hand is there. And this idea didn't originate with Wearsby. Most scholars recognize it. Uh, Esther being chosen as a queen. That wasn't accidental. Mordecai discovering the plot to kill the king. Not accidental. Casting the lots. They had, when, when, when uh, the wicked Haman cast lots, it, the, the lots, remember he cast the lots to see when he should kill the Jews. And the lot came down the month of Adar, which was 12 months away. That meant that... Uh, that uh, Esther and, and Mordecai and, and God's working had time to work out a plan to save the Jews. The kings welcomed Esther. He didn't have to hold out the golden scepter. If he hadn't, she'd have been dead. The king's patience. First banquet, what do you want? Um, how about a second banquet? The king's insomnia. And his lapse of memory. Now we find out about the good Mordecai had done. And then, of course, finally the king's deep concern for Esther's welfare. So while God's name isn't mentioned, his hand is, covers every single page of the book of Esther. And that's kind of the way it is in our lives. We see God working our lives. Sometimes I look at today and don't see what he's doing but six months from now, I look back and say, yeah, I see what God did. I, I understand more what God did in my life 20 years ago than I did then. And if you examine your own life, you'll probably find that that's to be true. Or true. In fact, I, I went through things 20, 30 years ago that I was angry with God about. Now, I was unhappy with myself for being angry. There's never an excuse for it. It's sinful. But I looked and says, why would you let this happen in my life? Now I see why he did. And it was good. But I didn't see it at the time. And that's kind of the deal with the, with the book of Esther. God's name isn't mentioned. None of those, those great virtuous things that we read about with the other biblical heroes. They pray. They seek God's face. He answers their prayer. Angels come. Lots of good stuff. You don't see any of that. But we see God's hand anyway. And sometimes that's the way it is in our lives. Uh, God is doing a good work in the lives of his children. He ha that is a promise of his. It's just sometimes difficult to recognize it when it's happening. But if you look back, you can see, yeah, I see why he did that, and I see why he did that over there. And I don't know about you, sometimes I'm a little bit angry with this guy, Stucky, for being unhappy with God. Now, I know it's wrong to be unhappy with God. Please don't misunderstand. And in, even when I was unhappy with God, I was angry with myself for being unhappy with God. But I'm still unhappy with God. Are you going to be honest with yourself or you're never going to grow? I'm not happy with my attitude at times. But I can see now why God was doing it. And he's bringing me along. He's doing the same with each one of you. And uh, this is a great book to see how God stands in the shadows and makes things happen. He is in sovereign control. He was in sovereign control the whole time, even though his name is never mentioned. And he's going to be in sovereign control all summer in your lives. And Lord willing, we'll come back next fall and start the book of Psalms. That's the next group. I'll take them as they come. <laughs> Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for being our God and loving us. You are wonderful. You're a fabulous God. Thank you. I'm sure that all of us in this room are sorry uh, that at times we have been unhappy with you because there's never a good reason to ever be unhappy with you. You are perfect and righteous and sovereign in every respect. We're fortunate to be able to call you Father and Lord and Savior and Master. 
I pray you'll give everybody here a good summer. Bring us back safely next fall to learn more about your great program for planet Earth. In Jesus' name we pray.